Hi, everyone. Get ready for the How I Raised It podcast, a show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Jesse Draper of Halogen Ventures, a $50 million early stage venture fund focused on startups led by women. Jesse shares a lot of great insights into how she got her fund off the ground and also what she's looking to invest in now. If you are tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 questions investors are going to ask you. This will really help you prepare to raise capital. To get instant access to this, click the link in the first comment. And while you're there, please leave us a comment about what you like about this show. I really personally appreciate that. And last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button, hit the bell to get all our latest episodes. Thank you. Sit back, enjoy the chat with Jesse. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Jesse Draper of Halogen Ventures coming to us from Los Angeles. How's your day going? It's good. It's good. It's nice in Los Angeles. There was a weird thunderstorm last night, but other than that, it's it's been nice. What part of, of LA or, you know, are you in? I'm in Los Angeles proper. Okay. Right in uh-huh. the middle. Cool. Cool. Where's the sort of startup heart of, of LA now? Is it Santa Monica or downtown LA or it feels like it kind of moves all over a little bit? It does move all over, but LA you have to realize is like 10 cities in one. And right. so, you know, I try to convene my meetings wherever, like, you know, downtown Los Angeles is some of our e-commerce fashion companies. And then, uh, Santa Monica, I feel like is like a lot of the, you know, startups in, um, like upfront ventures is there and which is like one of the larger funds. And so I feel like they're kind of a good center of gravity. And then, um, the, uh, yeah, so I'd say they're, they're everywhere. I mean, I feel like I've done stuff in studio city all the way to like, yeah, wherever. Interesting. 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 Good. Cool. Well, let's jump into it. Um, what is Halogen Ventures? Talk about what you are up to. Yeah. So I run Halogen Ventures. We invest in early stage female founded consumer technology. Um, And so there has to be a woman in the founding team of five. Um, We have 70 companies now and we have three male CEOs. So I like to just say we don't discriminate. Uh, (laughs) There just has to be a female in the founding team. And, um, you know, we're doing good work. We're in consumer technology. So about 25% of our portfolio is, um, consumer like Carbon38, which is an international athleisure marketplace partially owned by Foot Locker, um, or uh, Tea Drops, which is a biodegradable uh, tea company where you can, it's like bagless tea and beautiful shapes and uh, delicious flavors. And, um, and then all the way, the rest of them are pure tech plays like Trust and Will is estate planning online uh, mm-hmm. at an affordable price. And, um, we are, yeah, we're kind of all across the board. We also do a lot in childcare, um, and future of family. Oh, interesting. Future of family. That's, that's cool. I just did a podcast like 10 minutes ago with, uh, the founder of a life, which is an IVF, uh, company. They just raised some money kind of taking AI and software and applying it to, fertility so kind of interesting oh cool that's great yeah cool cool well here's a little fun little fact so i've pitched your grandpa and your dad two separate companies neither wrote a check that's okay but maybe (laughs) 10 15 probably 15 years ago i was working with a startup called autonet and somehow we got connected to your your grandpa i went and pitched him and then like five years ago when i was starting founder suite i I pitched your dad, Tim Draper, and here's the funny little story about that. He's like, sure, I'm happy to take take a pitch. Let's set up a pitch meeting. I'm like, cool, great. I got a pitch meeting with Tim Draper. I drive down to meet him. 
And turns out he has me pitch him in front of Draper University. So in oh, front yeah? of 40 students or whatever it was, I've got to pitch your dad. And it was really fun. Um, so anyway, I haven't. It's uh, fun. Those students are so smart. I'm really proud of what my dad has done with that school. And, you know, they have, it's a very international um, student body and they, yes. uh, and it's fun. Like those pitches are fun. And I think they point out different things and, you know, he's training them all to be entrepreneurs. So they love, uh, yeah, he's, he comes with a posse. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's fun. I was down there month or two ago giving a talk to the current batch and there's just fun energy in the room so i definitely oh, yeah. see why he's so into it <laughs> um cool excellent so talk about maybe the the backstory or genesis of, of founding halogen how guy how long have you been doing this and were you angel investing or what were you doing before maybe talk about the the genesis story yeah yeah. I mean, um, I think my route was like not so traditional. Ironically, you've mentioned my dad and my grandfather. I'm actually a fourth generation venture capitalist and the first female, but because I was female, I didn't think I was allowed to do this. I didn't think I was allowed to go into finance at all. Um, even though my mom worked incredibly hard raising four children, the hardest job, um, my dad was a venture capitalist and he would like take, you know, my mom say, okay, you're going to a conference, take a kid. And I was the oldest. And I felt like I went, I've been around the world with him going to these incredible business conferences, watching what he does, take pitches, speak, et cetera. And it was an invaluable education. Um, because I was female, I never saw a woman in these rooms um, ever uh, from China to the United States. I mean, I never saw a woman. And I felt very like, oh, this is so cool, but like, I'm not allowed to do this. And so I started thinking about that and thinking, okay, well, what career can I go into? And they say, you can be what you can see. And my aunt was an incredibly successful actress. She was in a show called um, 30 something in the eighties, nineties, and which is apparently coming back to Netflix. Um, but I was like, oh, well, that's what women do. So I went into acting. I had some success, was on a Nickelodeon show, did a bunch of movies. And simultaneously, I was auditioning and I had kind of my dad in the back of my head saying, how are you going to make this a business? Um, and I remember I went to this very sort of like degrading audition that just made me feel terrible about myself. And then I got in, invited in about 2008, 2009 to the first Twitter conference in Los Angeles at the Skirball wow. Center. And I was like, this is something I'm familiar with, conferences and men in suits. And so I went and I was like, these are my people. Um, and there were a few more women there. I felt like things were happening, at least in Los Angeles. I, I felt like I was seeing more women and it was like these early days of like the blogosphere, if you will. Sure, yeah. um, and it was sort of a moment where I was like, you know, I think I'm going to do something in this space. And so I created the first tech talk show. Now there's quite a few as you're familiar with, but I assure you it was the first, it was like me and beat TV in 2008, 2009. Uh -huh. um, and no one cared that I had like Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google on, and no one wow. cared that I had like Elon Musk and all these like incredible entrepreneurs because it was such a um, specific category technology was it hadn't been like Hollywoodized Silicon mm. Valley hadn't been like turned it into this TV show. Um, and so I created this talk show, this tech talk show, um, took it to television. We were nominated for an Emmy, but with that show, I then built out a, um, technology news blog. We acquired a blog in Los Angeles called Lollawag. And we started building out kind of a business insider type, uh, company and, um, you know, took that, that journey was about five years. And I hit this moment where either I'd go raise capital for it, being very familiar with that industry, <laughs> or um, my husband pointed out that. So through the show, uh, I did five seasons of the show. After two seasons, I realized I'd only interviewed men in technology and I was facilitating mm -hmm. this problem I had seen. And so I said, oh, hey, where's the women? I'm going to interview 50% women in tech on my show. And they came, it was like, I had sent out the Batwoman signal and I was getting hundreds of women coming to try to be on the show. Um, I'm forever grateful to the women of fashion technology, like 
Rebecca Minkoff was, is always very sort of like tech savvy Jen Hyman from rent the runway, which will pro- like, I think they filed and are going public. I think, mm-hmm. uh, I think there's, uh, quite a few, the guilt girls and, that made it okay then for Sheryl Sandberg to come on the show. And then like, it just sort of spiraled into effect. I was getting pitched a lot by these early stage companies and I was sending them like paperless posts. I was sending them to Draper Associates and to um, Sequoia and to all these places and they were getting funded. Um, A lot of companies that you've heard of. And I realized, okay, I know what a good deal looks like. Um, Maybe I can write a small check or negotiate some sweat equity. And I created a nice little personal portfolio Um, one of those deals did really well for me. And I sold for a 25 X return on the secondary market, uh, in less than 18 months. And so at this time where either I went and fundraised for my business, uh, I decided I was watching a lot of people enter the space and I was like, I've already, and they went and raised like Brit Marin from Brit and co was like going and fundraising. I'm like, I've already been in this for five years and I am not like, we're barely breaking even. CBS still today owes me money Hmm. Um, there. It was such a broken system. And so I, I sort of said, you know what, I'm going to step aside. My husband's like, your portfolio is doing really well. And I think in the back of my head, I knew I'd raise a fund, but I really had to convince myself that it was okay for women. It's so crazy. Like that it was okay for women to do this. And so I went, I pitched, you know, 500 potential investors closed 50 for my first fund. Um, we now have 85 and, you know, we're two and a half funds in and we um, have about $50 million uh, AUM and we have 70 companies and um, we've had about 10 exits to date. Um, I've sold companies to P&G, Walmart, um, Twitter, um, and, you know, it's going, it's going well. So that's kind of my origin story. No, well. I appreciate story. the origin story because I'm a superhero fan and there's always a good or- origin story of superheroes. I love it. No, it's really good. What was, what was the name of the, the tech talk show and is it findable on any, any streaming service? Yes, un- unfortunately it's findable. Um, it's <laughs> called the Valley girl show. And if I knew how to take them down, I would take them all down uh-huh. because I painted the world pink in the early days. And then it got better and like more professional. We hired a production company and the whole thing. But in the beginning, you know, it's like anything, like I had my brother's film, they were in high school. They got bored during the interviews would put the cameras down. I duct taped lamps to the wall for lighting. I mean, it was like out of my parents' garage. It was just a complete like mess, but we then, it. you know, took it to TV and it, it was like a big, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I look back and a lot of those companies, you know, we were the first people to like interview Dropbox, um, Drew yeah. Hopkins from Dropbox, um, Julia Hartz from Eventbrite. Like we had yeah. these, and I'll, I try to post every time one goes public, like Coinbase just went public. Um, and I had Brian on really, really early and he was just lovely. Um, there, yeah, it's been, it, it, it's been kind of a fun thing and it taught me a lot about media, which I think is changing and the model's changing. Everyone's trying to kind of figure it out now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, running a company and then, um, yeah, running a startup myself. And so now I, I kind of look for, I'm very discerning with media companies. <laughs> like yeah. Now yeah, I'm like. Bet. How are, like, you really need to have some interesting revenue streams for me. Very cool. You ever keep, think about keeping it going just to sort of, as a deal flow source. I'm kind of thinking like Jason Calacanis has all his shows, which all seem to just drive deal flow to his portfolio, right? I I think that's why he does it. (laughs) Probably because he likes to, you know, talk as well. But um, yeah, any thought about keeping it going just to create that funnel? Uh, yeah, I do still have kind of a big media footprint and I do a lot of TV shows. Um, uh, and so I think that that continues, but I'm full-time running a fund and yeah. it's a full-time job to run a show. So uh, I do more of the like guest star. So let's talk, since this show is called How I Raised It, let's talk about that that first fund. You mentioned you pitched 500 investors, landed 50 of them. Um, couple questions here. I'll try and keep it simple, but how did you sort of identify those 500 over what time frame did it take you to, to pitch that many and, you know, give us sort of the nitty gritty in the weeds view of, of that process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, it was exciting and hard, but the first people I approached were, were the network I had created with my talk show. I mean, a lot of these people I'd interviewed on my show um, and I went and started pitching. I got, you know, Alexis Maybank from the Guilt Group invested and then um, Todd Wagner, who was uh, Mark Cuban's business partner on broadcast.com um, had been on my show after Mark and he uh, he invested and, you know, I started just tapping this network I had created. I think when you first go out to fundraise, it's hard to qualify uh, who is the right investor for you. And I think you have to start identifying like what is making people write the check. Yeah. And we were looking for women in consumer tech. And I started just seeing at first, I thought I was going to go out and you know, pitch all of these female philanthropists with billions of dollars. And I realized that ended up being the biggest waste of my time because they'd rather give away their money. Um, and then when, when I would get to the meeting where I'd sort of be like, okay, are you going to invest or not? They're like, oh, so it turns out I don't really understand this and I don't feel comfortable doing this. Will you talk to my husband? Will you talk to my private wealth manager? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd say, yes. Like, I would love to talk to them. Um, no wonder this has been such a long process because normally you kind of know in the first like meeting or two if they're going to invest or you're moving forward. And so I stopped pitching philanthropists, but because we were, um, and something I'd say to women out there listening and to men is women need to put their money to work. Women should be involved in every financial decision within their household. Make sure your daughters are learning about money and investing. I mean, you know, know where your money's going and take risk with your capital. Um, it was, you know, it's been frustrating for me as a woman raising for a for-profit venture because I'm often put in this charity nonprofit bucket because they're like, mm. oh, it's women. You know, there is a, a pipeline problem. There's not a pipeline problem. I saw 5,000 deals last year. Like there's not wow. a pipeline problem. You're just not looking in the right places. If you need deal flow, I got it guys. Uh -huh. yeah. um, <laughs> and um, there, and no, it's really cool is when you pick a bucket like women, you get a different pipeline. So mm. we have over 50% minority led companies from all across the country because we were looking for the coolest female led businesses mm. uh, and consumer. And when you look at Silicon Valley, which I love and literally grew up upon, um, it's the same investors going into the same founders, going into the same deals. And it's like the same community. And what you really need to do is be accessible to all. We need to like diversify this money in so many ways. Um, and so it's been really great for me. I feel like we find interesting deals and we think about diversity of age, race, and gender from the beginning. And I think that's where you kind of like change the ecosystem. Yeah. Interesting. What, how big was that first fund? 10 million. Okay. And so how long did it take to go through 500 pitch meetings? Is this three months, six months, a year or longer? No, it took about, I think I went the full 18 months. 18 months. Uh-huh. I mean, it's a lot of meetings and a lot of next meetings. And any like, I ask this of almost everyone, but any like, if you could give yourself advice on raising that first fund, doing it all over again, is there anything you would do differently. Um, I mean, I know it takes, it always takes a long time to do it, but like any ways you could have shortened that time frame or yeah. Any. Yeah. I think just, you know, you know, and like I was saying in the first or second meeting, and I think make sure you ask in the first meeting, like, is this interesting to you? Because if it's interesting to you, I'll send you my data room and we'll continue the conversation. If it's not interesting to you, um, please tell me, <laughs> Yeah. And I'll move on. Um, and it's so funny because when you force people to be honest like that right away, you see a lot of, of like, oh, well, you know, actually I'm not very liquid right now. And I'm like, yeah, thank sure. you so much for telling me that. And often, you know, I think women in particular take it very personally when people say no, and you literally, you just can't, mm -hmm. you just should just let those no's wash over you. It's a numbers game. You just need to find the right investors. Um, but I think that, you know, could have saved me some time is just making sure I knew in the first meeting if we were moving forward or not, because I would sort of hang out with these investors who'd feel 
bad or they'd be like hem or ha and be like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to invest. And it was just a nightmare yeah. um, where I'm like, I don't care if you do or don't like, just tell me, you know, yeah. don't waste my time. Um, and then also I have a three meeting maximum. Uh, uh-huh. If you're not, if yeah, like if I don't know within three meetings, like I'm done, um, yeah. I'll move on. There's so many investors in the world. And I think for founders out there too, you know, I have founders come to me and they'll be like, I pitched everyone and they all said no. Uh-huh. And I'm like, who's everyone? And they're like, oh, like I pitched eight VC funds. I'm like, right. okay, yeah, cool. yeah. plan on going out for 100 and you'll find something in there. Like you should just assume there's always more capital. Um, you just have to kind of go find the right money. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Awesome. So that was, that was fun one. And um, when was that time frame wise? That was how many years ago? Oh, yeah, 2015. Okay, cool. And then let's talk. I, the most recent one I think was 21 million. If I yeah, mm-hmm. correct. Okay. Yeah. And so talk about that process. Was it going back to the same people and like showing them your track record in fun one? Yeah, all our LPs came back in and then I added 35 um, and our check size... <laughs> still ranged from about 50k to 4 million. Um, And so it's just interesting. I think, you know, you need to go about it, like, just, for me, I kind of think, let's just get there. I don't care how many meetings it takes, I just need to close the capital. And at the end, you kind of like, let friends come in for less than than the minimum. But um, um, I, I think what I would say for emerging managers, which I'm still in that bucket is yeah. it was very frustrating. Another way I would save time is like, I went out and I met with all these fund of funds in the beginning uh, for the first fund. And they'd say, Oh, I need to get to know you for five to 10 years. Yeah. And I'd be like, well, I don't need you in five to 10 years. I'm hoping I have my LP base by then, you know? And I think you're always finding new investors, but also like that doesn't even make sense. How is that an emerging managers program? Um, There's something very broken in terms of emerging managers and then uh, female led funds as well. I think now I see um, that the largest endowments in the world are all managed by 20 advisors. So 20 Mm -hmm. advisors make the decisions on the majority of the endowments in the world as in like the largest capital in the world. And I think that needs to be broken because these people are inaccessible and they need to be accessible. Mm. And I was thinking like recently I was sending out a tweet just to see what people might think, because I'm trying to figure out how do I solve this? And like, how do you get capital going to different places? And I was thinking, okay, so you have your RIAs, which is like your private wealth management groups. And then you have the larger endowments, which have fund of funds and just bigger capital. Yeah. RIAs, it's one thing to like hire an RIA as a private wealth manager, but if you're an endowment and you manage like over 4 billion, let's say, you can afford to hire someone internally. And I think if you got rid of those 20 advisors who manage everybody, mm. then these thousands of endowments and things would have to manage their own capital. They'd have different deal flow, different, you know, hopefully make themselves more accessible because what I found is those are the least networked humans in hmm, the interesting world. That's interesting. I, I wonder if that's kind of by design because there's, you know, they're sitting on the proverbial stacks of gold and everyone wants a piece of them. <laughs> you know, totally, so but like if you're, I see where, what you're saying, but if you're in the business of making investments, you've put yourself in that position. Like, yeah. so I feel like I, I have a responsibility to take as many pitches as I possibly can because I'm in the business and I put myself in the position of taking these pitches regularly and being accessible. So I think that they should have to do the same thing, whether or not they manage billions of dollars, that billion, those billions of dollars, everyone should have access to those billions of dollars. If they're managing a fund, you know, or what have you, PE fund, hedge fund, what, like they should be able to uh, be more accessible to those people. Yeah. I, and I don't know that world at all. You're way more versed in it than I am. I'm, I'm, my guess is, 
when you're managing an endowment fund of, you know, teachers pension fund or something, you're probably going to sleep at night thinking, how do I not lose money or screw it up versus how do I optimize and get the most highest return? Right. You know, I don't know. I'm just thinking of their motivation and and how their wheels spin, but I could be wrong. I don't know. (laughs) I don't think there's a right answer. I'm trying to solve it myself. And if anyone hears this and has ideas, please let me know because I think (laughs) I'm always focused on how do we increase diversity um, in general from, you know, gender, race, and age. Like, I think I just want to make sure that everybody, that's how you build the best companies too, is you have that throughout the employee base. Um, and at the board level. And so I've been trying to figure that out because um, I am a well-networked individual and uh, it's, it's even hard for me to get in front of these people and I have a great track record and it's really interesting. Like um, I think that they, that's where I'm like, if I'm not getting this capital, nobody's getting this capital. Yeah. Right, right, right. If you've got not, not even just, the track record and the brand, but the legacy name too. I mean, that if you know, yeah, I mean, you still have to work incredibly hard, I think, totally. but like, yeah, like, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of situations where I'm looking at this, like something is just broken. Mm. I see what you're saying where they're like, okay, I'm sitting at the top of this pile of gold. Everyone wants a piece of me, but you do have to be accessible to an extent, you know, yeah. and I hear these, uh, endowment managers, you know, speak on panels occasionally and they'll be like, you need an introduction to me. And yeah. I'm like, no, that's, pr- that's a problem. Access to capital is the biggest problem. Who, who knows an endowment manager? Um, you know, some people don't even know a lawyer. Like, how do you, you have to be accessible. I feel like we try to be accessible. You can get me on LinkedIn, on Instagram. We have a website form you can fill out. Uh, we take pitches everywhere. And if you are investing capital in deals, everyone needs to have access to you. And it's exhausting. And it's like mm. a whole thing. And you have to figure out we have processes that we go through to try and see as much as we can. But yeah, when you say you need an introduction, like, I think that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That Not everybody good. knows somebody who knows you. Right. Not everyone had had you as your college roommate at Harvard yeah, <laughs> or at whatever. Harvard or Stanford. Um, interesting. Interesting. All right. So let's see any other tips you would have for maybe emerging fund managers who are, you know, kind of starting the process where you were 2014, five or six years ago, like what would you do differently or any advice for them? Yeah. Um, there is such thing as bad money. And we've had to buy out investors who didn't understand that venture capital is not liquid for seven to 10 years, which is sort of excruciating as essentially a startup founder yourself being a fund manager when the fund's still getting going. Um, So don't take all checks Um, and then, you know, make sure it's the right partnership and, um, and then just go find the best deals you possibly can. And I'd say when you invest, make sure you're investing in opportunity, not negativity. Mm, Yeah. Tips, any tips for finding the best deals? Like what do you do? You have obviously a brand and and you saw 5,000 deals last year. So that's a lot, but any, any ways to kind of plug yourself into that river of the best deals? Yeah, I think there's a nice, you need sort of a combination of, one, this inflow of thousands of deals, which you can create by networking as much as possible, meet everyone you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, you never know where a meeting's going to lead, but then also you need to have sort of theses around what are you investing in? So for us right now, we're doing a lot in childcare and future of family, FinTech mm-hmm. and FemTech. Okay. And, um, so we will both look at the deals that come in, in addition to seeking out some deals when we're like, oh, let's solve this problem. Let's go see all the companies uh, doing this and see, decide who's the best. So I think you kind of need a combo of both of those things, but also I think our founders put us in that, like, you know, if you have great founders and you've been helpful and value add, Um, they send you great deals and they keep an eye out for you too. I feel like I get the best deal flow from my founders um, Mm. uh, and fellow VCs and just general community. I feel like I have had 
a girl from camp in fifth grade find me on LinkedIn because someone wanted an intro and I've gotten a deal from her. I haven't seen her since fifth grade all the way to, you know, great VCs um, who share a deal flow or say, hey, we're growth stage. This is too early. Thought it was cool. Um, but I think you just kind of once you start getting in the mix, it's um, you can easily be accessible because people are looking for capital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay, I won't keep you too much longer. For entrepreneurs, you know, interested, uh, childcare, future family, femtech, how about stage? What are your other preferences, your wish list for, for deals? Yeah. We like to get in super early. So we do invest pre-products sometimes, but you really need to be able to prove to us that there's an opportunity and a market. And I love like the first or second mover in a space mm. um, and the craziest, wildest ideas. Um, and then, uh, on the other hand, when we don't invest pre-product, we like to see an incredibly unique proprietary product of some sort. Um, like, why is it the best? How are you going to protect it? Then we like to see some traction that could be a million in revenue. It could be a hundred thousand users, but show me something. Um, and then obviously I should have said this first, but the founders are so incredibly important and. It's funny, I've gotten a lot of questions recently about solo versus co-founders. Mm, sure. And a lot of investors are afraid to invest in solo founders. I actually have had more success with the solo founders that we've invested in than the co-founders. So actually my advice would be, if you are a solo founder, like all the investors are saying is like, we're concerned about investing in you because what if something happened? What if you... Sure stepped aside, went on a vacation, had a baby, like who can we depend to watch the money and keep the company moving? Um, is, do you have a great COO? Like just show me that you have a, a killer team complementing your skill set and who can kind of take control if you had to step aside for a second. Um, but with co-founders, I have to say it's so funny that it's such a thing that investors don't want to invest in solo founders because we have had like boyfriend, girlfriends, like have these huge fallouts. Like I uh -huh. just invested in a new company. Um, and it, it, it's a boyfriend, girlfriend. And I said, I am sure you're in love. It's going to be wonderful. You're probably going to get married and have a million kids. Let's negotiate the divorce today uh -huh. just in yeah. case this happens. Um, because I can't tell you how many times, like, it's like best friends get in a fight. Like you just need to pre-negotiate the divorce mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the things I have seen are out of control. I, I don't even, it's like so crazy, but Totally. You just want to know that someone's going to take this all the way. And I think that's the benefit of investing in co-founders. And, you know, it's nice to have a technical co-founder, but you could also just have a great CTO who grows into a co-founder role or not even. You just need a, a killer team. Um, but I think those are some of the things I would I would sort of advise to think about. Sure. Good stuff. Um, all right. Any other just bits of wisdom for founders, I guess, in this case that you'd love to share your favorite Bits and then I'll, I'll let you off the hook here. Um, I think for founders, just get out there. It's a numbers game. You will raise what you need. Um, but the best case scenario is you don't have to raise it all and you can own a hundred percent of your company and then sell it for a billion dollars. And then you are a billionaire. If you are a woman, this would be awesome because the data shows that women then inevitably invest that back into the ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, of women uh, and we need that in order to kind of like level out the playing field a little more. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. I think everyone, you, you heard about uh, MailChimp's uh, acquisition last week or two, right? For 12 billion, they never raised any outside capital. <laughs> oh my God. How many, how many entrepreneurs did that inspire to maybe dodge the whole venture world altogether and, you know, oh, go totally. off? The, you know. Oh, um, totally. Brilliant. All right. If people, if people want to learn more, uh, give us your, your preferred social handles and web URL and, and best way to reach you. If they're interested, warm intro, cold email, what do you like? Whatever. I am accessible. You can find me on LinkedIn, Jesse Draper on Instagram, Jesse C Draper on Twitter, Jesse Draper. And then you can, um, also go to halogenvc.com and we have a cold email form and we do get through those and we have a really, really great team. 
that helps me. And, um, you know, we are interested in, again, future family, fintech and femtech right now. Honest question. You can dodge it if you want, but have you ever invested in something that came in through that like cold form on the, on the website or yeah. 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 I mean, we see some really interesting things and sometimes people don't know how to get to you. Like we've done like a marketplace we've done. um, Yeah. And some, also the smart founders find me at a conference, like fill out the cold email form. They like, uh, they go through LinkedIn and get someone to do an intro. They do every single thing they possibly can to get in front of me. And like the greatest things that happen is like when I've seen it in three different places and then I speak or something at a conference and someone comes up and says, I just wanted to put a face to the name. I've been harassing you about my like, you know, cat genetic cat testing. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even laugh because I saw this girl last night and she's incredible and everyone should invest in her company. But, um, they're, you know, it's just, that's very helpful for me yeah. because we see so many faces and I think, I'm the kind of person who like over introduces myself because I see so many faces and sometimes I can be like, Oh, that's the, that's the company that does this. Mm-hmm. But it's like over introduce yourself to VCs because they see so much. I love it. I love it. That's great advice. Awesome. Jesse, thank you so much. This is fantastic. Um, super fun. I've been taking notes, lots of notes. Oh, um, cool. Well, good luck on fun number two and, and uh, onward and upward. So. Thank you. You too. You too. This is great. All right. We'll catch you. Catch you after fun three. How about that? Perfect. All right. <laughs>